And so Freedom Church, we have an opportunity tonight to hear the passion and the heartbeat for the next generation, for the students of North Texas in America. So I'd ask that you would join me. Stand on your feet tonight, and would you warm welcome our guest, Pastor Jackson Sandifer. Hey, if you could just stay standing just for a few moments. Um, thank you so much. Honored to be at Freedom Church. I've been to the youth ministry a whole lot. Uh, first time here on a Wednesday night. And I just believe that the Holy Spirit just dropped something on my heart for not just the individual, but for this church. Uh, I believe a, God can do a lot with a hungry church. Come on, and I just sense the hunger that is here in this place. And this is what he said to me. He said, desperation is never convenient. You want to be desperate? You better learn to practice inconvenience. And I just want to take a moment. Man, we don't need, we, man, we can have the band playing or not or whatever, but and I know that we've already gotten um, past, like, you know, the worship and everything, but, man, can we just, like, for one minute, can we just begin to lean into what God wants to do tonight? I believe that tonight he doesn't just want to, uh, for you to hear me talk. He doesn't just want you to hear about Youth Alive, but I believe that a hunger is going to be provoked within your spirit tonight that something is going to come alive again within your life again. And guess what? It's not going to stay here on a Wednesday night. Pa Pastor, Pastor Kendall, I believe that it's going to go into Sunday, and it's going, to, it's going to just begin to spread and spread and spread, that this church is primed for a move of God that is not based on lights, not based on a stage. It is based on the hunger of its people. But you better be okay with things getting a little inconvenient. Maybe service goes a little long, right? Not tonight, but, right? Maybe God's going to speak to you to talk to somebody, and maybe you're, you're on your way to something else, but he's saying, no, no, you need to stop. Oh, maybe it means turning off some things. I'm already getting into my sermon, y'all. All right. But maybe it means turning off some things so that, man, you can seek after him, man, he's wanting to light a hunger in you. Can you put your arms up in the air, Father? I pray right now against every distraction. I come against lukewarmness. I come against apathy and complacency. Lord, it is an attack of the enemy against the American church. But I declare tonight, not at Freedom Church, that this will not be a place of apathy or complacency. This will be a place of hunger. This will be a place of desire. This will be a place of longing and soaking in the presence of God. That, Lord, the word will be preached. The gospel will be presented. People will be saved. Bodies will be healed. This move that is coming to this church is based off the hunger of the people. Oh, ruin us tonight, God. Thank you for it. In your name we pray. Amen. 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 Come on. Woo! You can sit down. Man, uh, I know that like you haven't even met me yet. My name is, as Kyle said, Jackson Sandifer. Uh, my wonderful wife, Christina, is right there. She's not able to be here tonight, but uh, she sends her greetings to you, and we are the Youth Alive Missionaries Directors of North Texas. And man, I'm just so thankful uh, that this church supports what we are doing. I want to say thank you to Pastor Kendall for your support and what you're doing. Thank you, and I honor you just in front of everybody of what you have built here, not just the building, but the culture that is here in this place. Can you honor your senior pastor, your senior leader? Uh, I stepped into this position. I'm going to tell you just a little bit about what is going on and what's happening at Youth Alive, and then I am going to preach uh, something to you. But uh, I, I want to let you know where your money, where your generosity is going and what you are sowing into. 
We get the opportunity to train and equip youth pastors all across North Texas on how to get into the public high schools and how to um, equip and uh, empower their students to then go launch these things called Jesus Clubs, okay? And I don't know if you know this, I don't know if you've realized this, but man, our schools really need some Jesus. Our public schools, uh, our private schools, even some of our Christian schools need some Jesus, right? And uh, what we are beginning to see is we are seeing students that are sitting in our churches and sitting in our youth ministries that they no longer want to just sit in a seat, they want to get in the game. They want to do something for the kingdom of God. And we live off this verse, Ephesians 4.12, that we exist, pastors, you know, prophets, teachers, uh, evangelists, apostles, that we exist to equip the saints for the work of the ministry. And we believe that many of those saints and many of those workers of the ministry are not just 20, 30, 40, 50 years old, but they're also 15, 16, and 17, and 18 year olds. And we're seeing students that they are hearing the voice of God. They're hearing God speak to them, and they are stepping out in faith and saying, I want to do something in my school. And many of them are going to launch these things called Jesus Clubs where they're going and they are, they're, they're being trained, they're being equipped, they're being taught, how do I start something like a Jesus Club? I'll tell you a couple of stories. Um, there, was a, you, uh, there was a student that said, hey, I wanna start a Jesus Club, and God spoke to her to do it, and her dream was that she would see 30 students in a Jesus Club by the end of the semester. Guess what? On the very first Jesus Club meeting that she had, 70 students showed up to the Jesus Club. All right, just three or four weeks ago, I got word that at a Jesus club that had been launched and planted and be all being led by students, all right, um, guess what? Three students gave their hearts and their lives to Jesus with no youth pastor and no youth leader even there, all student to student. We're, we're, we're beginning to see a movement of students who have said, you know what, I'm tired of just coming to church, I want to be the church. And we're teaching and training youth pastors on what does it look like, and we're training youth ministries, what does it look like and what does it actually mean to no longer, right, no longer just say, hey, come and sit in my seat, but actually come so that you can be sent. Jesus said this, we've preached this all the time, We preach, man, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. I believe that there are workers sitting in our youth ministry right over there. I think that's the right direction. There, that way. (laughs) Y'all hear what I'm saying, right? I remember this. When I was a youth pastor, um, man, God just man, stirred me to, to be a part of the campus, and I'm involved in Duncanville High School, and, but two students got radically saved. They got baptized in the Holy Spirit. They got touched by God, and right before that, a man, I don't know if you know who he is, but his name was Denny Duran. He gave me a prophetic word, and he said, God's going to give you two, and you're going to see a revival here in Duncanville, and uh, right after that, two students through our campus ministry got saved, And they went back to their school, back to their hallways, back to their football team, back to their classrooms, and they started witnessing, evangelizing, and reaching their friends for Jesus. Man, they started seeing students say, they started a Bible study in their locker room, right? And in one semester, we baptized 38 students, come on, in our church that were from our campus ministry. And here's the coolest part. Teachers were there. Principals were there. uh, Coaches were there. Why? Because God was moving in such a powerful way. And I believe this, that the schools are a war zone spiritually, Because guess what? The enemy wants our schools too. But maybe they're trying to close the doors. Maybe they're trying to to say, no, 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 we can't have Jesus in the schools. But you want to know what we're saying? That we're sending in sleeper agents. 
and they're not 20, 30, 40 year olds. They are 15, 16, 17 year olds and they've been filled with the Holy Spirit and they've been touched and marked by God and we're seeing them go and touch their friends for Jesus. Right now we have 25 Jesus clubs across the Metroplex, right? And that represents about 500 students in a Jesus club on a weekly basis. By the, by the first week of March, we should have 40. That will represent 700 students on a Jesus club. Uh, whenever, uh, by the time the next school year starts, after all of our trainings and everything, and this is very, very conservative, we will probably have over 60 Jesus clubs across North Texas, and it will be about 1,000 students in Jesus clubs all across schools. And, I mean, we're just seeing a true move and a true, a, a true, man, something's coming alive in students. And I'll end with this, talking about Youth Alive. I'm sorry, Bryce, I didn't use any of my videos, but it's okay. I'll end with this, I'll end with this. Billy Graham said this before he passed away. He said he believed that the next great awakening in America was gonna come through the church, but in the marketplace, okay? Our dream, our prayer, what we're asking God for is that we would be a part of ushering in that next great awakening. But it's not going to come through us. It's going to come through the students that are sitting in our seats and in our youth ministries. What if we had the opportunity to train, equip, and mobilize and send students now when they're 14, 15, 16, so that they were still winning people to Jesus when they're 20, 30, and 40 years old, right? Come on, we, we, man, we are raising up radical Christians for Jesus because I believe there's no other type. That we have to have students who are radical followers of Jesus. And I believe this, that it's not just gonna affect our youth ministries, it's not just gonna affect our schools, but it will affect the marketplace in five to 10 years. Because we are teaching students how, we are teaching students how to live a radical, radical life for Jesus. Can I, can I say this, and just hopefully an encouragement and, ch and a challenge to you? God didn't call you to just be radical when you were a teenager. <laughs> God's calling you to be a radical Christian right now. Right here, right now, in this moment, he is looking for radical followers of Jesus. He is, he's, he's desiring a radical church that is obsessed with him. Can I believe that I believe, or can I say that I believe that I believe Freedom Church can be that kind of church? That the people here can be that kind of people. I have about 20 minutes to provoke a hunger on the inside of you. Is that okay? Can I do that? To provoke something on the inside of you because guess what? I never ever want to lose my hunger. Because if I lose my hunger, guess what? I'm no longer dangerous to the kingdom of darkness. There's a story uh, that one of my professors at Christ for the Nations told me. He was sitting on a plane. He was sitting next to this man, and they were serving him food. It was a long flight, so they served a whole meal to them. He ate his food, and the guy next to him didn't eat anything. And he began to strike up a conversation with him, and he said, hey, why aren't you eating anything? And this is what he said, word for word, verbatim. He said, well, Actually, I'm a warlock, and I'm fasting against all pastors today. He's like, well, this is awkward. You want to know what I got from that story? What if the church, ooh, what if the church took our mission and commission and calling that seriously? What if? I mean, what if we were that hungry and that aware of the spiritual war that is going on, right? Man, like, have we, in this moment, have we backed off and have we started to just coast? 
Have we, have we become like the disciples in Mark chapter 14 when we should be like the disciples in Mark chapter 1? I'm, I'm going to give you some context here. To contrast, Jesus has just started his ministry. He has called four to six of the disciples. And um, this is what happens in Mark chapter 1, verses 35 through 37. It says, very early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up. He left the house. He went off to a solitary place where he prayed. Simon and his companions went to look for him. And when they found him, they exclaimed, everyone is looking for you. So look, Jesus is trying not to be found, right? He's like trying to sneak away. He's like, these people are annoying. Okay? He's trying to get away from them. And I don't care if they're in the Bible or not, nobody likes waking up that early. Yet Peter gets up along with some other disciples and they knew very little, they haven't experienced much, but it says that they went looking and searching and chasing after Jesus, right? Shows a curiosity, shows a desire, shows a wonder, a hunger from the disciples. And they went to look for him. But then something shifted, something changed. I want, I want to take you 13 chapters later. Many of us have read or heard this story. Jesus and his three disciples one of them being Peter, who is in both stories for sure. And, and Mark, war, Mark 1, we're with him. They've had the Last Supper, and they are in the Garden of Gethsemane. And now Jesus wants them to be there. He actually is like, hey, I need you to come. I need you to stay watch, and I need you to pray. I need you to tarry while I'm here in this spiritual battle, this difficult moment. And this is what happens. Mark chapter 14, verses 41. It says, returning the third time. So this has already happened two other times. He said to them, are you still? Everybody say still. Are you still sleeping and resting? Enough. The hour has come. Look, the Son of Man is delivered into the hands of sinners. Man, what? This, this blows my mind. Because in Mark chapter 1, they were looking. They were searching. Oh, they woke up early to find Jesus. But in Mark 14, when Jesus needs them the most, in some of the most intense spiritual warfare that we could possibly imagine, they choose to fall asleep on Jesus. What happened? How can this be? But then I realized this can happen to us a whole lot. <laughs> that this, oh, like how many... Too often, it's like, oh, we were once hungry. <laughs> we, we once would seek after him with everything we had. We once had awe and wonder. We once prayed for the sick. We once would fast and pray. We once would wake up early. We once uh, couldn't get enough of God, but then something shifts in our lives. And somewhere along the way, it's so easy to lose our wonder. My question to you today, if you're being honest, are you still seeking and searching and pursuing? Or are you sleeping? <laughs> Have you got caught in a slumber just because of life and family and task and all that, and, and none of that is bad. But have we got lost in a slumber? 
Because the word of God says, guess what? He's a rewarder of those, not who are sleeping, but those who diligently seek after him. Am I right? That he is looking for a church, and I believe it's called Freedom Church, that is not going through the motions, but is wanting him to move. That, that, that is searching and looking for a church that is not passive, but is passionate. That desires adults that are not satisfied on yesterday's bread, but says, guess what, God? We want new manna. We want fresh manna. We can't live off last year. We can't live off yesterday. Oh, I want fresh manna. I want a fresh encounter, I want fresh revelation. And I've been praying and I've been believing that today he's waking people up from their slumber spiritually. That right here in this church tonight, you're not gonna walk out the same because you've been awakened not by a pastor or a preacher, but by the Holy Spirit saying, awake, oh sleeper, awake, oh sleeper. He's waking up intercessors again. He's waking up seekers again. He's waking up people that are pursuing him again. He's waking up people that will fast and pray again. He's waking up secret place dwellers again. Oh, like I said when I started, God can do a lot with a hungry church. And I'm here tonight to simply challenge all of us, me, as a church, that as his disciples, that we would not fall asleep in this moment. In fact, many scholars and commentaries actually suggest that it was such a dark presence, such a spiritual battle there in the garden, that that's why they, they like chose to go to sleep, because it was way easier to be asleep in that moment than it was to be awake, because it was so oppressive and so, so hard and so difficult. I don't know if you've looked around lately, but man, sometimes it can look a little hard out there, right? Sometimes, man, the spiritual battle is just real. Sometimes, man, it could just be heavy out there. And many times it's just easier to go into a spiritual sleep instead of to wake up and battle and fight and pray and seek and pursue. There's a spiritual battle going on and it, it was in the middle of Jesus' most needed moment, and I just believe that the church is at a place where we're in a battle, and it's a very crucial moment, and we just need Christians and followers of Jesus that would just say, you know what, I'm not gonna go to sleep on you, God. I'm not just gonna go through the motions and show up to church and then leave, but no, I am going after you. I need a new fire, I need... I want fresh manna, I want, I, I want a fresh wind, I need it. He needs prayer warriors, intercessors, he needs a witness. He needs people that are on fire. We need churches that are alive. People that are alive. I need a church that is awake. Let me, let me tell you this. Somebody sent me this because we do Jesus clubs, right? I'm just kind of saying this so that I could uh, show you what kind of spiritual battle there is. And these are just in the schools. It's probably other places too, but um, we do Jesus clubs. But I just got a video in Illinois or from a, that there's a school in Illinois. This is on Fox News, okay? So, um, but like in Illinois where there is... Um, in, in a sixth grade level or whatever, there are Satan clubs being started. Satan clubs. Why are, like, why are you telling us this? I'm trying to show you, guess what? We gotta, we gotta be awake. We need to be aware that no longer can we just walk into the doors and go through the motion. So how do we do this? Man, we need a church that's able to move things in the spiritual realm. There's many Christians that show up to church, but guess what? They can't move anything in the spiritual realm. I don't know about you, but I wanna, when I pray, I want darkness to flee. <laughs> 
When I, when I speak, I want demons to tremble. When I fast and pray, I want, I want chains to break. I want things to shift in the spiritual realm. Does anybody else in here want that? Or are you okay with just like, oh, normal Christianity, whatever? No, no, no. Oh, I want that. What does that look like? You want to know that we begin to move things by being at his feet. I'm going to give you a quick, quick download. Y'all all probably heard, or most of you probably heard the story of uh, Jesus and Lazarus, yes? Where Lazarus is dead, Jesus receives word that Lazarus has died. He's hurting, broken. He comes over to where Lazarus lives. And this is what it says, the word of God. It says, Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would have not died. Remember, Martha's the one that was busy with everything, right? Okay. He's busy with everything. If you would have been here, my brother would not have died. But even now, I know that whatever you ask from God, God will give you. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he, sh though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? She said to him, yes, Lord. I believe that you're the Christ, the Son of God, who is coming into the world. Worship team, you can come. So they're having this conversation, and Martha makes a very big confession of faith, yes? I believe you are the Christ, the Son of God. Like, this is, this is huge. And she's asking Jesus to heal and to raise Lazarus from the dead, yet, yet, it says Jesus stayed where he was. It's very interesting to me. Jesus doesn't come to Lazarus. He actually just stays outside. Jesus doesn't move or go anywhere. So let's keep reading verse 28. When, she, when Martha had said this, she went and called her sister Mary, saying in private, the teacher is here and calling for you. When she heard it, she rose quickly, went to him. Now Jesus had not yet come into the village. Y'all hear that? He had not yet come into the village, but was still in the place where Martha had met him. Mary, or when the Jews who were with her in the house, consoling her, saw Mary rise quickly and go out, they followed her, supposing that she was going to the tomb to weep there. Now when Mary came to where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet. Fell at his feet. Saying to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus, this is powerful, when Jesus saw her weeping, and the Jews who had come with her also weeping, he was deeply moved. Everybody say moved. He was deeply moved in his spirit, greatly troubled, and he said, where have you laid him? Oh, this wrecks, this wrecks me. Martha is asking Jesus to come, makes a confession of faith. I believe in you. He stays. But Mary comes, lays at his feet, and says, man, what happened? Why haven't you, why haven't you done anything? She's weeping, she's crying. And he says, then he begins to move and say, where have you laid him? We know the end of the story. He goes, he takes Lazarus, and, 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 and he raises him back, to, to, uh, back, to, uh, back from the dead. And it's like, what, what was the difference, right? Like, what happened? And I believe that Mary, and we see it through Scripture three different times, Mary had a habit and a pattern and a history of being at Jesus' feet. So because she had a history of being at Jesus' feet, guess what? She was able to move Jesus' heart. And I don't know about you, but my heart, my longing, my desire is not to be on a platform. It's not just to hold a mic. It's to move Jesus' heart. And I believe God is calling you as an individual. He's calling you as a family, as a marriage. And he's calling this church to say, guess what? It's not just about being in a seat. It's not just about showing up. Yeah, that's first. But guess what? It's time to go up to another level. It's time to go up to another place and say, no, no, no. There's more for you. I, I, I want you to move my heart. 
And when we begin to move God's heart, guess what? We're, we're going to start seeing healings. You're going to start seeing people saved. You're going to start begin, beginning to operate in spiritual gifts. You're going to begin to see when you pray and fast, things begin to shift in your home and in your family. I believe you're going to see prodigals come back home and come back to this house. Why? Because you are able to move the heart of the Father because you've been at his feet.